And now your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to It's a Miracle. If there's a common thread in the stories you're about to see, it's how our lives can intersect in unusual ways to bring about miracles. It might be a friend, a relative, even a stranger who holds the key to your fate. And in our first story, that key may have meant the difference between life and death. After moving to Texas to start a new life, Katsy Blackman's relationship with her son Jason hit an all-time low. I really don't understand. What could you possibly have in common with these people? They're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. I was angry at my mother for moving me to Texas. But you wanted to come here. How am I going to agree to it? I was 15. It was a complete culture shock for me. And all the people that I had grown up around were now 2,000 miles away. And I didn't know a soul here. I tried to make up for that. I didn't know when we were coming here. Yes, Mom. He was very bitter about moving here. I don't, do. I don't want to deal with you right now, what? all right? Jason, we've got to work this out. <laughs> we had no support system down here, no family or anything. I felt that I had really become a bad decision maker. That everything that I tried was resulting in really becoming worse. The constant battles left Katzi in a state of severe depression. I felt like I was in this narrow tunnel and everybody was getting further and further and further away from me. And I couldn't reach them anymore. I was really lost and I didn't even know why. I would see my mom cry on occasion. I hear it through the door, but I was never right there trying to help her through it. I didn't want to be bothered with her pain. I was too wrapped up in my own. Worried about Jason. Katsy turned to her friend, Bo Carver, Get for advice and support. Let it out every so often. It was a wonderful friendship because he is caring, he's a great listener. Just kind of spill my guts about what's going on, you know, so just... But what he heard made him very worried about Katsy's mental health. When I first met Katsy, she was very positive and full of life. And over the course of time, that began to change. To get everything done, always. You could see the pressures were starting to build. And not one thing is worth, <laughs> not one. I began to notice those things gradually at first, but over a period of six months, it began to go downhill real fast. Bo convinced Katsy to see a doctor who diagnosed her with clinical depression. She began taking prescribed medication to help with her condition, but the drugs could not protect her from her son's growing fury. Jason is a stronger personality than me. He was more aggressive. I was pulling up the rear, trying to be a voice of reason. Do you ever do what you say you're gonna do? Do you ever go where you say you're gonna oh, go? Do what I'm gonna ever? Do. It was a big one that night. Jason comes first, doesn't Over he? the same things. Don't you think I know what's going on, Jason? I don't Jason? think you know anything. What do you think? Don't you think I look at you and I know My mother started crying, and I started walking away down the street. Jason, please! Jason, And even though she called after me, I just kept walking. Jason! That was the last I saw of her that night. It was sad to me. I didn't understand why I just was so hopeless because I had been, like, mesmerized by that idea and that there's always something around the corner, and I didn't see anything, nothing. That's the mask of depression that people don't understand. In the depth of her despair, Katsy came to a sudden realization. It seemed like the clearest thought that I'd had in months. If I could just exit the picture, things would be better, and I truly believed that. I would go somewhere where no one would find me, and no one would know where I was. And I was very peaceful. I was calm and peaceful. I took off down the highway and didn't even know what direction I was really going. I was just out on the highway. So I drove, 
I don't know how many miles to a motel that sat off the road a little bit. I uh, need a room for just one night, please. What? Room 107, please. Thanks a lot. You have a good night. You too. I made my way to the room, locked the door and put the chain on it. I didn't even reassess at that point. It seemed reasonable. And it seemed like it was as much the right thing as any other right thing had been in my life. And so I took all the pills and made sure that I took them slowly so that I wouldn't throw up or nothing would happen to the plan. You say this little prayer when you're a child, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. And that was the only thing I could think of to say, just to keep the people around me safe, make life better for them. And that was it. Katsy was alone and dying in a place where no one knew to look for her. But in an uncharacteristic move, her son Jason returns home that night. Typically when I would say I was going to a friend's house, I would come back the next evening or two days later. It was very odd that I had come home that evening. Mom! I walked through the hallway. She wasn't here. And there was no note, no message on the answering machine, nothing. And though it seemed odd, I figured she's an adult. She can do what she wants to do. Across town, Katsy's friend Bo had already retired for the evening. I'm a heavy sleeper. But this particular night, I awoke and I stared right at the clock. And it was a digital clock, and it said 3 o'clock in the morning. Immediately, the thought of Katsy came into my mind. I didn't have a real good feeling when I thought about her. Hello. Is your mom there? No, she's not here. When Jason told me that she wasn't I'm home, concerned about her. I was just real concerned about where she was. Maybe we can game plan to see where you think she might have gone. The plan was for me to drive from my apartment to their house and then for us to sit down and discuss ideas about maybe where she might be. At that point, I said, well, I'll jump in the shower. But as soon as I had that thought, an immediate impression came on me that there was no time for that. I just took off. I just began to say a prayer, guide me and protect her. Katsy's home was more than an hour away. And by the time he arrived there, it would be too late for his prayer to be answered. But Bo persisted. I didn't know if she was just running away. Protect Katsy. Maybe she just me. went to a friend's house. Guide me. And I just kept repeating the prayer. Protect Katsy. That's the only thing I knew to do at that point in time. And suddenly, something mysterious happened. About three quarters of the way to their home, I looked over out of the corner of my eye and saw this Ramada ensign. I just felt compelled to drive around the parking lot of that hotel. I remember thinking to myself that I will never tell anybody about this. Because if I said to them that I'm looking for I don't even know what, I know people would think I was crazy. But as I made the third turn, I saw her car. I can't believe her car's parked here. There was just an immediate sense of urgency. I knew at that point that, that was a miracle even finding that car. But little did I know that that was just the first part of it.
Listen, I'm sorry I'm coming in like this, but would you please check and see if you have a Catsy Blackman checked in your hotel, please? I can't give out that information. It's hotel policy. I wanted him to know that I was concerned for her health. She's been going through a lot, and she's been taking medication. And there might be a likely possibility that she might be taking her life. Would you at least call and see if she's OK? That's all I'm concerned about. Would you do that for me, please? I'll call and let her know you're in the lobby. OK, that's fine. There's no answer. When he said, there's no answer, I said, we've got a big problem. Listen. If you've ever trusted anything in your life, you need to trust this situation. I began to really kind of plead with him at that point. Check and make sure she's OK. That's all I'm interested in. Can right. you do that for me? Fair enough. Please. And he said, OK, let's go check. Patsy, Patsy, come to the door. Are you there? Open the door, please. Please. Open. He grabbed his master key, opened up the door. Patsy? The door was Patsy. chained. Chains locked. Let me get maintenance to cut this. Please hurry, hurry, hurry. As the night manager went off to find the maintenance man, just this massive emotion hit me that, that there's no time. Catsy! When I went in, I saw her laying on the bed, and a lot of pill bottles were laying to the side. Come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. While the night manager ran for help, Bo tried desperately to awaken Catsy, but there was no response. Many, many emotions were passing through me at that time. What'd you do? I felt like that I might have been too late. I just can't get her to do anything. I can't get her to respond. She took all those pills over there. Hold Bo was relieved when the paramedics finally arrived, but his fears were far from over. Okay. As soon as they came into the room, they escorted me out. The situation looked real grim. Well, if she's breathing pretty shallow and the blood pressure's low, let's go ahead and get her in the back of the ambulance. OK. I felt like, how could all these miraculous things take place? But then it was too late. And what was the purpose for that? I felt like that I'd let her down. And that was the last time I saw her until she was taken to the emergency room. All Bo could do was wait and pray for one more miracle. When I looked into the emergency room and her eyes looked at me, I knew that, that she was alive and that she would be OK. I was able to come out of this zone of not seeing anything to really seeing things a lot more crystal clear. And what was undeniably clear was that Katsy's life had been saved by a miracle. I realized what an incredible miracle it was. <laughs> so many things had to come together to make this happen. Jason had to come home at the right time. A very sound sleeper rising out of a bed. Bo had to wake up. It was almost like, this can't be real. If Bo Carver had not listened and followed his instincts and felt that it was all right to feel crazy or all right to feel all those things that he went through, there is no way that I would still be alive today. I have referred to him on some occasions as my guardian angel. Today, she also refers to him as her husband. And together, they're forging a new personal and professional life. I say, come lay back in the arms of compassion. And now, I guess we're seven or eight years down the line, and I can still say it's still wonderful. So the answer isn't written in a bottle. He is my best friend. He's my partner. Yeah, and. I'm very thankful to have him. I'm very grateful to have him. When the rivers rise, oh, yeah, awesome. they'll keep saying when I the rivers am rise, okay? looking forward to spending the rest of my life with Catsy because I love her so much. When the rivers rise, 
Over the years as I've grown up, my mother and I have become the best of friends. She is a very vibrant soul, and what she gives to other people and to me is absolutely amazing. I'm eternally grateful that I got a second chance to have her in my life. Katzi's brush with death has convinced her that miracles are available for everyone. Be aware, look, listen. It happened for me. There are miracles out there. They're out there.